Omar Siddiqui with EFRI, the Electric Power Research Institute. I'm there on behalf of uh, my colleague Liang Min from the Stanford Bits and Watts Initiative. We'd like to welcome you uh, to this week's installment of the Digital Grid Summer Webinar Series. Uh, and today's uh, theme is corporate research, and we've got a wonderful uh, panel of corporate uh, 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 corporate people to speak about the role of corporate research in the digital grid uh, development uh, arena. So just to go over a few matters of housekeeping, and uh, for a number of you, you've been uh, loyal uh, participants in, in these webinars, so you're familiar, but for some of you, this may be your first time. Uh, we have everyone on, on, uh, on mute just to keep um, uh, some semblance of uh, sanity as we go through because we, we uh, like having and look forward to having a large number of people. The best way to engage, and we do want your engagement in this webinar, uh, is to ask questions via the chat feature. So if you look at the uh, bottom of your, uh, of your WebEx, WebEx screen, as indicated by the uh, picture there, you'll see a little, um, uh, little cloud icon. That's the chat feature, so you can click on that. To, um, to engage and ask questions. Uh, there's also a related Q&A feature that you can use. And um, as moderators, we will be monitoring those questions and we'll um, ask questions from that group and we'll ask questions of our panel as well. Uh, you can also select yourself as an attendee to virtually raise your hand and uh, we can unmute you at that point. But I would really recommend the chat and uh, typed in Q&A feature is the most efficient way to ask questions to our panelists. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so by being on, that's your consent to being part of this recording. And we will post the presentations as well as the recordings on both the Stanford and EPRI uh, websites for, uh, for, later, uh, for later use. Again, uh, we are delighted to uh, co-host uh, this, both uh, EPRI and Stanford. Uh, EPRI, we're an independent not-for-profit research organization uh, doing R&D in all, all aspects of um, utility, electric utility operations from generation through transmission, delivery, and end use. Ultimately, our mission is to advance uh, the uh, electric service uh, uh, to be uh, safe, affordable, reliable, and environmentally responsible through collaborative research. And that collaboration includes industry, our utility industry, industry partners, and uh, academic partners uh, like Stanford. And we're so proud to be associated with Stanford uh, in this effort. Uh, the Bits and Watts Initiative, of which, uh, Liang, uh, which Liang directs, is a major initiative focused on uh, innovations in the electric grid for the 21st century. And uh, they advance a number of uh, business and policy and technological innovations to uh, push, the, push the front frontiers on the next generation of, um, of the electric grid and the consumer relationship with the, with the electric grid. Our summer webinar series uh, is really intended to convene experts from across multiple disciplines to exchange their views on what uh, the vision of a shared integrated uh, digital grid looks like. And on the right, you see some examples of elements of what a uh, shared digital grid represents. Uh, the idea is uh, to get this diversity of perspectives and to identify uh, the gaps towards achieving this vision. And one of the fundamental gaps that we've identified, which has been a theme throughout our webinar series, is uh, the development of enabling data platforms uh, that can uh, facilitate uh, the information exchange from consumer assets to the grid to allow the kind of um, uh, coordination uh, to provide flexibility and other uh, kinds of uh, uh, benefits to the grid. Uh, and finally, uh, our intent is to inform through this collaborative process a research roadmap and a collaborative initiative that EPRI intends to um, uh, uh, coordinate with Stanford and other industry partners uh, to develop uh, a, a research plan to specifically address the gaps uh, that have been identified uh, through these webinar series. And, you know, and it, it, digital grid and integrated grid uh, has many different uh, uh, manifestations. The principal one we, we like to think of here from an EPRI perspective, and I think this is a view shared by many, is to think about uh, the integration of customer resources uh, to become assets to enable and help facilitate grid flexibility while fulfilling their primary objective to satisfy uh, the end use customers 
needs and objectives of those technologies. So that balancing act to make it as seamless as possible and coordinated as possible is really one of the end goals um, of this. To, to, and, and to do this, we really recognize that this is a, uh, a heavy lift that's in an all of industry um, effort and hence uh, the motivation for this, uh, for this webinar series to exchange those ideas. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Liang to give a, a bit more context and talk about today's panel. So, Liang, over to you. Thank you, Omar, and uh, uh, welcome to this webinar again. And uh, just a quick uh, recap what uh, we have been doing in the last uh, uh, several weeks. So, we started this uh, virtual webinar workshop back to June timeframe, and uh, in June, we hosted the three virtual webinars and uh, included uh, the utilities in the United States, European countries, and also several information technology companies uh, like Google, Intel, Microsoft, and the VMware, et cetera. So if you are interested in uh, listening to what we have discussed in June, and uh, you can find the recording available both at uh, APRI uh, Technology Innovation website and also Stanford Business World's website. And, uh, uh, in July, we planned four webinars. Uh, the first uh, couple of webinars we had in July is uh, uh, from the startup company. We had one panel with uh, uh, three distinguished startup companies, and we have a university panel and, uh, with uh, Stanford and the Dartmouth University. Then uh, we had uh, uh, the government panel last week with the Department of Energy and CERDA and also California Energy Commission. Today, uh, we are very glad to uh, have the support from uh, uh, three, uh, I, I would call like a little bit traditional power management company, and uh, have them to discuss, uh, not about, they will discuss for sure their, about their product, but um, more importantly is uh, the research going on at their company related to how we can integrate the customer DER and provide the value to the electrical power grid. And uh, uh, next week, uh, the, with the polling we had a couple of weeks ago uh, for the interest from the audience, uh, we're going to have the panel talk about the value of resilience from customer DER. We have uh, uh, Stephen Walsh from Department of Energy and also Command and Southern Company uh, specifically discuss some of their uh, pilot project for the community resilience uh, efforts. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, today's panelists. And uh, again, and, uh, we put together a, a distinguished panel for today's conversation. And the first, we will have uh, Michael Vergansky uh, from Eaton to kick it off. And uh, Michael has two hats, and uh, he is a senior VP of R&D, uh, responsible for intelligence power management solution. And also on the business unit side, he is the Chief Technology Officer for Eaton's electrical uh, sector. And uh, he has a long career in the power management industry, and uh, he joined Eaton in 2015. Before Eaton, he was uh, Vice President uh, for System and Control Engineering at UT Building and Industrial System. And uh, uh, before UTC, he was a VP uh, for uh, Leno and Assistant, was uh, eventually uh, be uh, bought by United Technology in 2005, and uh, upon joining UTC, he had uh, several executive positions uh, responsible for uh, global security products and uh, for power management products uh, for UTC as well. And uh, our second speaker uh, is from Hitachi, uh, the digital arm for Hitachi, Hitachi Ventura, and they have a Millie Groom. And she's a senior product manager for energy practice and digital solution. And uh, he also has extent, she also has extensive career uh, in enterprise software and the information technology area. And uh, she led, uh, uh, she leads uh, Hitachi uh, Ventura's digital transformation uh, strategy, and uh, also lead the uh, business uh, customer engagement with the Hitachi customer to deploy this technology on, uh, on the field. And uh, before he touched, uh, Millie, she spent six years and building different IoT Internet of Things application and solution on the PREDIX uh, platform with GE, 
and she work at GE Digital and also big heels of, of GE uh, for the smart manufacturing and oil gas industry. Our third panelist is from Siemens Corporate Research. Ulrich Munz is the head of autonomous system and the control system at the Siemens Corporate Research Center in Princeton, uh, United States. And uh, uh, Ulrich leads the R&D work for autonomous system control and uh, uh, he is also responsible for two uh, US DOE funded research projects. One is from APAE, it's called the Renewable 100, and sounds like a very interesting name, 100% uh, Renewable Generation and how we can manage the electrical system. And another one funded by uh, Solar Technology Office. And uh, before uh, move to United States, and uh, Ulrich also uh, work at uh, uh, Siemens Corp Research Center in Munich, Germany. Uh, without further ado, so we will have uh, Michael to kick off today's conversation. Okay, hey, thank, thank you very much, and I uh, really appreciate uh, you know the invitation. Glad to uh, be here, and really the, this topic of the digital grid is something that's going to be important to all of us as we go forward and stuff. So I'm really excited about uh, about today's presentation. So as we get started, there's really a few takeaways that I'd like everybody to keep in mind as, as we go through this. Uh, you know, the first one, and those of you that are in the electrical industry, it's probably one of the most exciting times that we could imagine. There really is a period of rapid transformation uh, that's occurring. And, you know, it, it manifests itself in several ways. I mean, safety, resiliency, um, are, continue to be paramount in all aspects, and efficiency is another another part of that. But now more than ever, when we start looking at natural disasters that have been occurring, that safety and resiliency continues to, to even become more critical um, as we think about the grid of the future. Modernization, digitalization, these are going to help drive the energy transition that, that's coming, and we'll talk about that in, in more detail. Um, when we start looking at what the grid's future is in the digital grid, what we're going to see is that from the utility side and also energy consumers, things behind the meter, everything is starting to look as a grid. And this is a tagline that we're using at, uh, you know, at Eaton, and that the, t the control technology, the amount of DERS that are deployed are going to be the same, just at different scales, both in front of the meter on the utility side, but also behind the meter. And if we're going to have a grid that's going to be uh, able to accommodate a lot of the new technology trends, <clears throat> a lot of the efficiency that's going to be needed, and the safety and resiliency that's going to be demanded, we're going to have to make sure that we have open platforms that can really exchange information and control to make these systems become uh, efficient. Okay. So, Let's take a look at just historically what's what's happened. And if you go back to, you know, really the, the beginning of utilities and electrical energy transmission distribution, um, it's been a unidirectional flow of power. We would have energy that's generated, it goes through transmission lines, and then it hits substations, and then it's distributed out to a lot of different types of energy consumers. And you can see on this, I mean, Eaton plays in a number of these different uh, a number of these different areas supplying all of the electrical power and infrastructure that's needed for the distribution and utilization of electrical energy. But what's that, <clears throat> excuse me, what's happening as we look at the future? What we can see is that there's really multiple forces that are coming into effect here that are going to be transforming the traditional electrical uh, power value chain. And some of these are occurring through evolutionary aspects, and then some of these are really occurring on a transformational aspect. If we think about evolution, there's always been regulations that continually focus on increased safety, increased resiliency, and sustainability. And as we start thinking about the natural disasters that have been occurring um, throughout the years, this emphasis is becoming more and more important, even in our traditional electrical power systems. Um, global competition standard harmonization continues to occur, and that's really a, that's really a good thing that, that's happening. It allows us to provide solutions at really a cost-effective uh, 
price point to consumers. And then there's a number of different technology evolutions on the power side that are occurring. If we think about the type of loads that are inside of um, everything from residential to data centers, they're becoming more DC in nature. So there is going to be a natural disruption to traditional AC transmission and then how it gets converted over to DC and there's power losses. And we will start seeing a world where there's gonna be more and more DC power all the way from the point of generation through transmission and distribution. Now on the transformational side of the equation, there's a lot of things that are going on. Um, the grid is, is in a lot of places very old and has served us well but there's the ability to go and modernize it and put in new capabilities, new forms of resiliency. Distributed energy and especially green energy has become more and more important as we think about sustainability and social responsibility uh, to reduce carbon emissions. And green energy is going to become the newest form of, it is the newest form of electrical generation that's starting to transpose um, itself onto our current grid. And then with this, once you start getting new types of energy, you're going to have to have digital solutions to start creating the control algorithms, the robustness, the efficiencies, and just the intelligence that's needed to manage all of this complexity. So we can see that when we start thinking about where energy gets distributed, you have a number of different market forces that are coming into play. And then also there's something that, that we see in our industry, and that is workforce and skill set challenges. And that as we move, especially from an analog to a digital world, it's something that we're going to have to keep in mind and make sure that we simplify the technologies that we're developing and putting forward to be able to accommodate the, the growing needs of energy consumers. So why is the industry transforming? And I just want to walk you through a couple of different aspects of this. When we start thinking about the demand side, you know, the, 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 the if we look over the last 20 years, electrical energy consumption has remained relatively flat. And while there's been an urbanization that's been occurring, there's also been an efficiency gain that's coming in, everything from LED lighting to different types of heating systems, so that as energy has been increasing from a consumer point of view, the efficiency side of the equation has maintained the, the, uh, the amount of net energy needed is relatively neutral. However, when we start looking forward and we look at some of the mega trends that are that are out there, we see electrical demand increasing pretty significantly over the next 20 to 30 years. Some of it's on driven by building electrification. As we start thinking about moving from things like gas heating to electric heating, that's going to increase a demand and the amount of energy that's needed. Um, electric vehicles. As electric vehicles start taking more and more hold across the globe, that's going to drive a tremendous need for new types and new sources of, of energy. And then the last one that I want to point out is really the growth of cloud computing and data centers. And when you just think about, you know, how efficient and reliant we are now on cloud computing as we are in a uh, kind of mid-COVID world, and people are working from home. Cloud infrastructure is making it possible for us to do webinars like we're conducting today, as well as working from home. And when we start looking at the increase in telemedicine, AI, data storage, we see a 4X increase in the demand of electrical energy just from data centers alone over the next 10 years. So it's going to be a significant amount of new energy that's required. Now, we're not building new new single generation power, power uh, uh, stations. But what's happening is renewable energies are starting to become really where the new sources of energy are coming from. And we see renewables counting for over 50% of the generation over the next 15 years. And along with that, storage is going to be needed because we want to make sure that we're harnessing the power of this renewable energy and using it onto the grid. So as we start thinking about that, we start looking at system resiliency and optimization and then, of course, cybersecurity. And there's going to be a tremendous need for new types of infrastructure requirements that come in and really uh, lay themselves on top of what were traditional um, electrical safety and resiliency standards. So what does this look like? 
So when we start thinking about it, in the previous diagram, we had a unidirectional flow of energy, and now what we can see is we have the traditional power generation coming into transmission stations. But on the grid side of the equation, we could start seeing grid-scale storage and renewables, and this becomes that manifests itself down into the distribution uh, arena as well. So utilities are going to have to manage where the, where the energy comes from, where it gets sent to on a dis distribution basis, and be able to manage this on an availability and a cost-effectiveness uh, point of view. Now, on the same side, when we look at behind-the-meter type of applications, we're going to see the same type of infrastructure just at a smaller scale. You can see solar and other renewable energies, distributed storage, and then different types of consumers that are taking place. And the nature of the grid says is that we're going to have to make sure that both sides of the meat are harmonious in the way that they, they produce, consume, and transact energy. So how does that happen? How do we make sure that as we move forward and everything starts to look like a grid, that we have the right set of infrastructure in place to make that happen. And this is where the notion of a digital platform and digital technologies that transcend both sides of the utility as well as behind the meter applications come into play. This is going to be needed to make sure that we have the right infrastructure for on-demand planning, decision support. There's going to be new types of business models that are created. And really, I think the one that's probably going to become just as critical as, as functional safety in the electrical industry is cybersecurity infrastructure. We, can, we have to make sure that the same amount of standards and the same disciplines that we have towards functional safety are in place for cybersecurity aspects, so we're protecting ourselves from any kind of um, unauthorized access, both in front or behind the meter, as the grid becomes more digital. So I want to talk a little bit about what is a digital platform and just go through a couple of different layers. This may be laid out in a different way than you may have thought about it in the past, but I want to start with two aspects, and that is open and scalable. Um, any type of digital interchange that's going to connect both utilities and power energy uh, consumers is going to have to be open. We have to make sure that there's standards in place to allow for the seamless flow and integration of information, and that's what's going to allow us to grow at scale and really do it in a cost-effective manner. So what's the role of a platform? Well, simply put, it collects, aggregates, and analyzes data. But there's multiple layers that are made up to it. And if we start at the bottom layer, when we think about the electrical layer at the physical grid, this is all of the controls and apparatus that are out there that allow us to go and produce, transform, and distribute energy and protect electrical systems. It could be capacitors, capacitor banks, transformers, um, circuit breakers. These are all the things that are out there making sure that electrical energy flows safely. The second layer is really some of the most critical, and this is where a lot of time has to be spent to make sure that we have standards and common interfaces in place to allow for the effective open communications of these devices and the data that it's going to generate so that we can go in and create it, store it, aggregate it, transmit it, and make sure that this is used to make real-time and, and informative decision-making. And then last piece, if we do this right and create the right layers of a, of a digital platform and all the information, now we can start building the applications that provide all the command control and decision making that's needed to help go and govern the electrical system. So let's just bring that together and kind of think about it in terms of what are some of the key uh, actions that are needed at these different layers and some of the capabilities they have to, they have, to have um, in order to make this value creation realized. The first, if we start at the bottom with the electrical layer, you have to make sure that the apparatus that's in place, the transformers, that there's native sensing, the ability to connect and make sure that these assets are intelligent and controlled. And if you think about it, this could be very simple as what's needed to help me make our grid sustainable today. If we can detect that there's different types of outages that could occur, if we can detect that there's different types of 
uh, safety factors that could come in place. We could prevent a lot of wildfires, for example, that could be caused by you know defects or um, disruptions inside of the electrical system. So we have to make sure that at that base layer, all the products really are sensing the right type of information, they're connected, and they go from electromechanical assets to now becoming digitally native intelligent assets. From there, making sure that we have the right interfaces and the right type of um, data dictionary, if you will, that allows us to seamlessly exchange information across multiple vendors, across uh, di you know, different uh, participants, different companies and stuff, so that we can then go and make this information actionable inside of utility and also inside of a, uh, inside of a work site. So, you know, making sure that the platforms are cloud connected, network, there's data security. These are kind of the bare bones minimum must haves. And then we have to make sure that we can access this data remotely, we can monitor information and get the insights and analytics out of it um, that are needed to make the right solutions available for, for customers. And then lastly, if we do that and we build the right foundation, now we can start creating the right solutions to make sure that we have a safe, reliable, and efficient energy transition. Okay, so I want to just kind of bring uh, this to light in terms of a couple of examples. And this is how we're thinking about, you know, uh, corporate research. And we believe that it's not just a matter of corporate research, but it's a matter of partnering with our national labs, of partnering with um, organizations like EPRI, as well as universities and, and other companies. But if we think about this, and this is a program that we're working with at the Solar uh, Energy um, Technology Office at the DOE, and it's looking at how do you take all of these different type of behind the meter distributed resources and make sure that they're connected, make sure that they're um, you know, intelligent, and that they're going to be good participants um, onto the digital grid of the future. So a couple things we're trying to do is be able to make sure that we're more dynamic and we can um, you know, make sure that we have the, the right type of decentralized bi-directional grid growth that's gonna be needed um, stuff. How do we make sure that we're supplying the right delivery of services to improve grid reliability? And then lastly, how do we make sure that we're, we're looking at improving the observability and controllability and controllability without having to go through and overhaul the entire grid infrastructure. So we've come up and we're working on some, some proposed solutions and architectures to go and make this happen. Um, and it starts with just expanding traditional demand response type of applications, making sure that the smart meters that are involved support a number of different protocols and that they have the connectivity with a number of different um, you know, different type of, of technologies. You know, all of this has to happen while making sure that it's high performance and it's working with inside of the, the constructs and constraints that exist inside of our grid today. So um, in closing, I'll turn it over to some of the other, uh, you know, participants. But really, um, you know, we're really excited as Eaton about where the future of the grid is going and what we see as the digital grid. We think that it's a great time to be inside of the electrical industry, that we're going through that period of rapid transformation, and that when we look to the future, everything will start to appear as a grid. It's just going to be a matter of scale and how these integrate and connect. And, and lastly, we are looking at making sure that the right research and cooperation is in place so that we can create the open digital platforms that are needed to seamlessly exchange these informations and make efficient energy systems. Okay, so Leon, thank you very much. I think now we turn it over to Millie. Thank you, thank you, Michael, fantastic. Uh, just quick reminder for all the audience, if you have questions, you can type your question on the Q&A or the chat features or window below and uh, uh, after the three panelists uh, to share their perspective, we're going to kick off the Q&A session. Really? The floor is yours. Thank you, Liang. Uh, firstly, uh, thank you, um, EPRI, uh, for having me here and team Bits and Watts uh, from Stanford as well. Really great presentation, Michael. Thank you for setting the context. Um, and to folks 
you know, tuning in from anywhere today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Millie Gurung, and I am the Senior Product Manager at Hitachi Ventera, driving um, product strategy and digital solutions for energy, specifically, specifically for uh, power and utilities companies. Let's see if I can move. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Just a quick glimpse into Hitachi. As I mentioned, Hitachi, I come from Hitachi Ventura. Hitachi Ventura is a wholly owned subsidiary of Hitachi Limited, a Japanese multinational Japanese conglomerate uh, with a uh, revenue of $85 billion annually. And as you can see, um, Hitachi globally invests about $3.5 billion every year on research and development. And we have about 119,000 plus global patents to date uh, uh, worldwide. Oops, I'm having trouble going back and forth. Sorry. All right. So I think Hitachi today is really uniquely positioned to uh, for the digital transformation to deliver really val to deliver real value to our customers. Uh, it have over 100 plus years of developing operational technologies like power generation, transportation, construction, uh, medical imagery technology, and so forth. And we also have about 60 plus years um, of informational technologies around traffic control systems, storage, communications, um, uh, now big data and analytics. So in other words, really the technology foundation for IoT. And IoT essentially is really about the integration or the convergence of both the physical and digital worlds that can result in big um, social and economic impact. And our uh, deep expertise in OT and IT is really driven by our strength in innovation. And some of you may have already heard that um, Hitachi acquired ABB Power Grid and a new JV was formed as of July 1st this month, so ABB Power Grid brings a lot of that OT expertise that are really around energy management solutions, apart from just the large, you know, high voltage transformers and so forth. So we want to be able to augment that expertise with our Hitachi's digital capabilities. And you can think, imagine the kind of a strong uh, portfolio that we can reach out to customers, you know, with our strong competitive advantages. Let me see if I get it right this time. <laughs> so this is a um, Lumada Edge to Cloud strategy for IIoT. Uh, and this is kind of elaborating a little bit on what Michael had said about really creating that data platform as we move forward to modernizing and digitizing our grid. Lumada is a big brand within Hitachi. It's very inclusive of all the offerings, but it's also very comprehensive on what it can offer uh, as capabilities to our customers. Um, and looking at this slide from left to right, left is where you are, uh, you have all of your you know, assets, and you, uh, this is where you have the initial generation of all the data closer to the assets, you know, whether you're taking your uh, data out from a SCADA or a PLC, or you're talking about video uh, or a LiDAR imagery and so forth. And we have an edge capability in the middle, which is the Lumada Edge Intelligence. This is sitting really close to those assets that are generating a lot of data and hence handling, doing a lot of data processing and handling, doing data uh, management. Uh, you're able to store and persist and forward and be able to also provide the real-time analytics as the edge. And edge, you know, uh, can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, depending on where you're sitting at, what context and perspective you're applying. But in this context, edge is really a software stack, which is hardware agnostic, and it can run on a small footprint device, like a gateway within your plant network, or you can scale it to run at a hardware appliance in a data center or in the cloud. 
So with that, I'm going to move into the Lumana data services. This is where we bring in the data, uh, whether you know, uh, you're running the data on on-prem appliance or into the cloud or any of these uh, infrastructures uh, or all of these infrastructures and be able to do anything from data integration to do that AI model management, doing data cataloging. And speaking of cataloging, um, Hitachi Venter recently acquired a company called Waterline Data, primarily with the expertise on data cataloging, which is really um, following the data, governing the data throughout the life cycle of the data. So uh, understanding the data lineage, providing the overall uh, data um, uh, governance, and really around the data sovereignty as well. And on the bottom here is uh, Data Lake Services. And Data Lake is uh, primarily the capability to generically store all of your data information that you aggregate in a much more cost-effective way. And most of the data lakes today are um, you know, really based on Hadoop and similar types of framework where they scale with compute and processing in a linear fashion. But with our Hitachi's um, Lumara Data Optimizer for Hadoop, you're able to intelligently share the data so you can continue to use your you know, offline storage data in a uh, object stores like Hitachi Content Platform and be able to cost effectively use your Hadoop clusters for much more real-time data that you need uh, insights on. And at the very far right is really the insights um, area. This is where uh, we uh, you know, develop solutions uh, or applications to really help customer uh, challenges and really help uh, customers drive outcomes. And as part of the um, energy solutions, uh, sorry, as part of the energy insights, this is where I'm primarily focused on today. And uh, moving on. And this is really building up from this earlier slide, you know, as you look at the customers today, you know, and depending where the customer is today in terms of their digital maturity or wherever they are in terms of um, uh, you know, d their digital transformation projects, you know, we have capabilities we can offer to really meet the customers in their journey today. So level one, level two, level three, and level four. Level one is really around that uh, data management and integration. This is really the first steps to unlocking the value in the digital power grid and moving on to uh, level two where you have much more insights of your data. When you talk about your uh, you know, assets, availability, reliability, utilization, really to provide a single pane of glass view across all of your assets. And here, you know, we have uh, solutions like um, uh, video analytics to be able to provide uh, situational awareness, doing intrusion detection, perimeter security, geofencing, and so forth, really around not just the physical aspect, but really around the workplace safety as well. Um, and then, of course, cybersecurity is managed services to really help uh, the utility customers in terms of being compliant with the NERC SIP requirements. And most of the customers, at least the ones I've talked to today, really fall under that level one and level two. And moving on to level three is really where you see much more you know, AI-driven uh, models and data science and predictive analytics. This is where you are looking to really focus on the overall you know, operations optimizations to help significantly reduce your overall O&M cost by using predictive uh, capabilities. So you go from being reactive, preventive, to really much more predictive and prescriptive, to be able to understand what should be the next steps um, uh, to really help uh, mitigate some of the challenges you're seeing today. And uh, from level three to level four is, you know, what we call this game-changing advantage for our customers. This is where you go, um, where utilities really want to incorporate uh, the customer centricity as part of the value chain, look at the overall system optimization uh, to really drive the business in insights and be financially optimized. And the solutions you know, around this area is really around power forecasting, load forecasting, understanding the DER and energy storage and be able to provide that consumption uh, data points back to the customers. And um, 
and as I mentioned, you know, with the uh, with this joint venture with ABB Power Grid, you know, we do have a lot of that portfolio under, under uh, energy portfolio management under market intelligence that we really hope to, you know, work together to reach out to the customers who are le looking to uh, um, benefit from uh, that combined portfolio today. And this is the Hitachi Eventera Digital Value Enablement. Um, this is really, you know, yes, we want to go through the customers in terms of identifying what are their key challenges, what outcome do we want to drive. And this is the framework that we use when you actually want to go and talk to our customers. So this is really an advisory-led consultative servicing where we meet with a broad stakeholder um, in an organization and be able to identify what are the challenges, what use cases, be able to help them prioritize these use cases and, have, and go through what we call it uh, value engineering, which is really establishing what would be the ROI and based on some of these use cases that's been identified. So it's a vision to value in about 12 weeks where we work with the customers and, their, and the SMEs in really understanding and getting a value in about uh, 12 weeks. And from there onwards, uh, you know, it's uh, that's sort of the MVP version. From there, we can assess, and if the customers really see the value, then we work on further uh, scaling the applications or solutions. And this is uh, one of the... Um, uh, implementations um, we're doing today in our uh, one of our customers in EMEA. I can't name the customer name, but it really it's a utility customers um, both um, have with energy and water. Um, and here the challenge is really around you know the highly distributed assets which are very hard to monitor and manage and hence really uh, impacting in uh, in the high O&M cost as well as the uh, service interruption. So we are using the Lumada Edge intelligence to really help a data collect data from all these different sensors to be able to predict the potential failures and r recommend the next course of actions um, with the aspiration that, you know, we will be able to um, provide a service quality and high customer satisfaction and be able to predict, you know, potential service interruptions uh, and so forth. Um, and this is r right now really in the middle of the deployment. As you can see from this diagram here, uh, it's very tiny, but Lumada Edge Intelligence is really uh, used in the context of a gateway, which is doing a lot of data aggregation, and then it's steering the data forwarding to uh, the GCP Google Cloud platform. And moving on to uh, the next uh, case study with the Optimized Prime program, this is one of the largest um, commercial EV uh, in innovation project based out of UK, um, and it's funded by Ofgem. Uh, and Hitachi Ventura is leading the project, and there are other uh, partners as part of this consortium. There is UK Power Networks, there is Centrica, uh, and the Royal Mill, which is really the uh, delivery, mill delivery system and service. And then the, we also have uh, Uber in the process. So this project is really aims to develop uh, the cost effective strategy and how to minimize the impact of the commercial EVs on the distribution network, right? Is how, do you, how do we quantify and minimize the network impact of this commercial fleet and what infrastructure in terms of networking or charging or IT is really required to enable the EV transition at scale? So we're about you know, 18 months into the project. Uh, it started back in January 2019. And because there's been a slight setback in terms of delay, not having all of these uh, private hire vehicles like Uber because of COVID-19, and hence the project's been kind of extended up to uh, February of 2023. And right now we're you know, working with 220 EV fleets today to really help understand what are the behavior of all these uh, EV fleets um, today, you know, whether they're uh, taking the EV back in the residential area at the end of the day to charge or you're 
talking about the fleet in a depot like Royal Mail, which we're working with 220 today. And then there's a scenario of a mixed charging, you know, with Uber that you get to charge during the day in some of these depots, but at the end of the night, at the end of the day, you come home and, you know, use the residential charging to be able to do that. So, you know, how do we get all the telemetry data, trip data, and to really understand the customer behavior and be able to scale this whole transition of the uh, electrification as well. And uh, moving on to this, bear with me, this is, I know it's 10 minutes, this is my last slide. This is a glimpse into um, some of our key R&D projects in Flux today, primarily in North America. And these projects were built as, as POC with customers, uh, really around DER management uh, to really help mitigate that duck curves and you know, optimize energy consumption and supply to reduce overall operations cost as well. Um, you know, maybe I can highlight one or two here. Uh, solar e EMS is really is a cloud-based application done with the POC with a customer in California with a uh, with a fleet of uh, uh, PV inverters, um, and it's basically visualizing what has been the solar production for the last uh, seven years, what has been the consumption, what has been the cost savings, um, and you know, CO2 emission as well. And right now, it, solar EMS does not have sort of a prediction capability, but when you look at predict win, one of the IPs here, that's the one that we've done with a, uh, again, another POC with an independent power company based in um, India to really be able to understand and predict um, uh, wind generation. As you all know, you know, if you are um, under committing, then you need to pay penalty. And if you are over generating, then you end up, you know, that's a loss in revenue for you as well. But these are some of the key initiatives that we're running uh, as Hitachi on top of the, you know, IoT data platform we provide to be able to scale and help customers in terms of their digital transformation. Uh, with that, I um, thank you for having me here and um, handing it back to you, Omar. Great. Uh, thank you, Millie. That was wonderful. And uh, our final presenter on this panel is uh, uh, Ulrich uh, Munz from, uh, from Siemens. And Ulrich, you have the, have the floor. Uh, so if you can advance to the next slide, you can go ahead. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Omar and Liang, first of all for organizing this great panel and for inviting me to present here a little bit of our work from Siemens and corporate technology. As you have seen in the previous presentation from Michael and Millie, companies like uh, Eaton, Hitachi and Siemens are developing cloud platforms to connect different kinds of components. Uh, for Siemens, I can say about smart meters, buildings, PV plants, battery systems. Um, we as a research center, we are developing algorithms for these cloud platforms. And one question that was popping up repeatedly during this process is, how can we develop a simple environment to develop these applications? And this is what I'm going to talk about today. We have developed the Siemens Energy Workplace for Analysts, how we call it, in short, SIBA. And I will give you a short glimpse into uh, this development. It's an ongoing process with our business unit, so it's certainly not a product that you could buy off the shelf. Uh, I will start with giving a short overview of Siemens and how Siemens is driving sustainability and the integration of DERs as a company. Then I will talk about our research center and how we support Siemens, our company, but also other organizations along this way. And then I will talk about Siemens and show some examples at the end. Let me start with Siemens. Siemens is investing a lot of money in innovation. And if you want to drive sustainability, from my perspective, there are two main factors how you can do this. The first is, of course, innovative technology for our customers, for other companies. But the second one is also leading by example. And this is what I want to show on this slide. We're doing both ways. Siemens has increased tremendously the R&D spending over the last years. But what I want to highlight here is that Siemens is investing about half a billion US dollars per year focused on 14 core research topics. And I depicted here only four of these 14, so this is not the complete field, but these four are the most relevant ones for the panel here today. So there's a heavily focused research on, for example, distributed energy systems, energy storage, which is not only battery systems, but also hydrogen systems, 
power electronics and connected e-mobility. So Unis is putting a lot of effort into uh, being innovative in those fields. On the other hand, as I said, leading by example is another important statement. Our CEO in 2015, five years back, announced that Siemens wants to become a CO2 neutral company by 2030. This is a pretty bold statement, and I want to show you here how far we have gone up to today. You see here the numbers on the lower left of the Siemens US CO2 footprint, and it has gone down more than 50% over the last five years. And this we have achieved in different ways using energy efficiency programs, distributed energy systems, uh, looking at the emissions of our fleets and green energy. To give you a perspective, Siemens in the US alone has 50,000 employees. So we're not talking about some offices, but we have factories, we have many locations in the US. And to get there was of course um, a, a big task. There is still quite some way to go, obviously, to get to, to CO2 neutral as a company. And as I said, this is the US part. Similar efforts are going on um, across the globe. Have a look at this from the Siemens perspective. I now want to take you into our research center and how we support our company on this path to be more sustainable and to drive innovation in that space. You see here a map of the US with different projects that our research center has been or is involved. We are supporting our business units in three different ways. First of all, we do consulting. Then we support our business units with product and solution development. And then we do real research, for example, in US Department of Energy funded projects. For the consulting, you see here a few cities that we work with in the past to develop, develop strategies how to become sustainable in the next 20, 30 years. So we compare different technologies and provide studies to these cities to make sure that they pick the right technologies, whether it's uh, new programs for the buildings, uh, improving public transformation, building wind and solar farms, and so on and so forth in order to meet their targets. The second one is working closely with our business units to develop new products and solutions. And I want to highlight here Galapagos Island on the lower left. Siemens has built there a hybrid power plant with diesel generators, battery system, and a PV plant. And the system is able to operate the islands to supply power to the customer there uh, without any CO2 emissions if you turn on the diesel generators. The particular challenge there was, of course, how do we make sure that the system actually runs 24-7 without interruption if you turn off the diesel generator? And I guess most of you are familiar running a system, even though it's a relatively small system, uh, with uh, zero inertia is quite a challenge. It's running now since uh, almost two years, very reliable, no issues, and it was a close collaboration, as I said, between our research center and the business unit. And the third category is DOE sponsored research project. Michael was mentioning some of those projects that Ethan is working on. We have also multiple of these projects. I just want to highlight here our project with Hawaii. Well, Yang mentioned it briefly at the beginning. I'm leading an RPE sponsored project, which is looking into uh, the operation of Hawaii, big island with 100% generation from wind and solar. So how can we actually demonstrate an operation of this island if you turn off all synchronous machines? I also want to highlight here again, I mentioned before the two components, innovation and lead by example. If you see, look at the right hand side of the slide, you see Princeton and this is our office. And we are also trying to lead here by example, not only for our company, but also for other office buildings by converting our own office into a microgrid. What you can see here on the next slide is a brief overview of the structure of this microgrid. So we installed a PV system on the parking lot with a battery system there. We installed a new building management system. We have EV chargers, microgrid controller, and the cloud connection. And again, this is for us a two sides approach. On the one hand, we want to do innovative research and demonstrate it on our building. Uh, as an example, I usually use the term that uh, we are the guinea pigs of our own research. If our algorithms do not provide the right results, then lights go off. And there are different fields, as you can see here on the slide, in and out of things and performance monitoring and analytics, of course, two very important fields. On the other hand, as I said, leading by example, we want to become CO2 neutral as our office. We are now producing during the day, in particular now with a lot of uh, sun during the day, 
uh, more electricity over the day than what we consume. And this is, of course, also a uh, blueprint then for other office buildings for Siemens, but also for other companies for our customers. And with this, I want to take you into the cloud space, I'm not going into the details Siemens is offering, as I mentioned at the beginning, Siemens is offering many different cloud applications. I will talk here uh, only about the Siemens Energy Workplace for analysts. analysts. And this is using our MindSphere environment, which is used by Siemens to collect all the data from different devices um, and then um, provide more insights for our customers. So what is SIVA? What is the Siemens Energy Workplace for analysts? Uh, on the left hand side, you see again a picture from our office in Princeton. And of course, what we want to achieve there if we are operating the system is we want to have an understanding of what is going on in the system and how we can increase the plant performance. This is what we care about as a plant manager. On the other side, we are also the data scientists and the researchers who want to develop interesting algorithms. Combining these two is a quite challenging task. Um, as was mentioned earlier today, uh, the communication interface between the real assets and the smart algorithms, this is actually a um, heavy workload. And this is what SIVA is providing. Uh, it gives you access to raw data from real plants, in our case, from our Princeton office, and an easy coding environment where data scientists can use Python-like language in order to program algorithms to create insights into what is going on in your plant, monitoring how to increase performance, or just visualization of the results, maybe the CO2 reduction thanks to the installation in our system. Next, I want to show you two examples of applications that have already been developed in this platform. Uh, one of them is a PV soiling app. So what you can see here on the left-hand side is soiling of PV panels. And um, obviously, many of these PV panels are standing in very dry areas. So soiling is definitely an issue for many of these plants. Uh, and then the question is, when is it worth sending in a team to clean the panels, which costs money? And the question is, how much can I increase the revenue by cleaning the panels? So we developed an app, which you can see on the right-hand side, a little bit of the data, which is estimating the daily losses that you create by the soiling. And then, of course, you can decide, the operator can decide when to send in his team for cleaning the panel. The second app I want to show here is actually used for our system on Galapagos Island that I mentioned earlier. It's used for battery monitoring. As you're for sure familiar, batteries have challenges, um, or it's important to know the, the state of health of your batteries in order to predict how many more years the batteries can be used and when they may need to be replaced, or maybe also to decide about different operation modes. And uh, this application is getting, gathering the data from Galapagos and creating an estimate, and you see the different estimates, some of them coming from the state of health estimation from the battery managed system itself, some of them coming from different algorithms that we implemented. And as I mentioned, one of the nice features of, of CYA is that we can easily implement new algorithms, test them, and of course, eventually then bring them to our customers. I want to highlight here also that uh, CYA is a joint development, as I mentioned, with our business unit. But more importantly, we are now opening this up for external partners. We have a first collaboration with a university where the university brings in their data, they have on campus uh, distributed energy system, and then they open it to their students to actually use this platform and create their own algorithms to improve the performance of the university's plan. And we're looking for more partners. So if you are a university, maybe a research lab, and looking for something like this, please just send me an email after this um, panel, and then we can get in touch in a separate meeting and discuss if this is possible. Last but not least, thank you very much for your attention. And then I guess Omar or Liang are going over to the panel. Terrific. Wonderful. Thank you very, yeah, thank you very much, Auric. So, uh, Aurelie, can you bring the slides back to the, uh, with all the three panelists? Well, first, I'd like to kind of uh, help the panel warm up a little bit here. We do receive uh, some questions from the Q&A, but uh, uh, the first kind of little bit general question is, uh, for Eaton, Siemens, Hitachi, each of you uh, uh, have several business units and uh, have the 
in the energy sector, power sector, also has in the industrial sector, and even healthcare sectors. And uh, some of the things we talk about here, like the data, the communication, that is also very important across the sectors. And uh, some of the things, um, you know, we touch a little bit, maybe more important in, in other sectors, like the privacy, the data privacy, the healthcare sector is more important than privacy and the power sectors. And uh, uh, so the question is, what experience or lessons learned from other business units in your company can help you or inform you think about the data platform in our sector, in power sectors? Uh, I don't know what's the order, but maybe we start with Michael and go to Millie and go to uh, Ulrich. Okay. Hey, thank you. Um, you know what, maybe let me take a step back uh, when, I, when I think about this um, and, and just give you the perspective that we have looked at it from, from Eaton when we start thinking about the nature of digital technologies. And we fundamentally as a company said, we're going to make, we're going to invest very heavily in cybersecurity. It really has to start there. Unless you become best in class at cybersecurity standards, proliferate that throughout your whole organization, and then make sure that you have, we believe, independent third parties that come in and verify your robustness in cybersecurity and stuff, it's really difficult to establish trust with companies on a digital domain. And we believe that that is critically important, especially in industrial segments like we like we are today. Um, you know, if you think about it from a, if you think about it, most of the effort that's been spent around uh, cybersecurity happens on the IT side. And we always hear about data breaches that occur when, you know, customer lists or profiles have been hacked or intellectual property has been stolen. But if you think about, if you think about the immediacy of the impact, you generally hear about it, but nothing necessarily happens for maybe several months, several days, several years. If you have a compromised industrial system, let's just say it's a SCADA system on an oil and oil and gas, um, you know, at a, at a refinery, or you have um, breaches that have occurred inside of utilities that have been well publicized, the the effects are immediate. It can be catastrophic and cause a harm of life. Um, it can, you know, the the benefits or the effects inside of a community are felt. Um, you know, instantaneously, and it's very widespread. So while all the emphasis on cybersecurity has been dealt with, you know, in the IT space, it's even more critical where there is, uh, you know, an emerging set of standards, but not a consistent set of global standards that everyone's united around when it comes to industrial markets and how cybersecurity is going to, um, you know, play into effect there. So we believe that that is kind of first and foremost has to be a core, um, a core competency of any organization. And we've partnered with a lot of third parties, outside third parties to come in and verify that our practices are robust, that they're state of the art and get independent audits that are occurring. Because we think that you have to have independent audits to kind of come in and, and go in and, and assess it. And right along with cybersecurity, is also the aspects around data privacy. It's becoming increasingly important. And, you know, from some of the other markets that we play in and benefits we've learned on the IT side, you have to make sure that the right amount of um, restrictions are placed on the data, how it's used. If you want to use it for additional research, how do you anonymize it so that you're only getting the pieces of information that you need to go and to develop, um, you know, insights and predictive capabilities for the future? So I, I would say we've learned a lot from all of our markets and have kind of set a blanket foundation that says this is going to be a very critical core competency inside of Eaton, and we'll extend that out to our partners. We offer cybersecurity services that could come in and help do assessments. Uh, and stuff and really help put best practices in place, both on the cybersecurity and the data privacy side, just to make sure that our customers, um, you know, can, can be um, assured that the solutions that they're putting forth and the practices that are uh, in place are state-of-the-art. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I think uh, 
cyber and the privacy are great. You know, we heard a couple of times in the previous panels uh, last several weeks are very important. So just uh, for audience information, you know, in middle of the second half of August, we are also putting another panel specifically to address the cybersecurity and the privacy issues. Fantastic. And let's go to Millie. Um, yeah, thank you, Michael. I think those are definitely on the top of my mind and, you know, in the industry we're in today really around that cybersecurity and privacy. And um, if I were to try and, you know, answer these questions in, in a slightly differently, you know, from my experience as one of the key learnings in the industry when you compare utilities uh, in, in manufacturing or healthcare, it's really around um, lack of uh, customer centricity. Um, I think uh, utilities today really lag behind in terms of, you know, articulating what the customer really wants and really articulating customer experience in the value chain, right? Um, I think there was a study done back in 2018 where by a company called Infosys Digital Outlook, where 79% uh, of the utilities believed they were customer centric. But uh, the catch is there's only 7% of the customers in that really share that perspective. So there's a huge gap on what utilities thinks is their version of customer centricities versus the customers, you know, like, uh, like rate payers like you and me and the, and the others. Um, and, I, and I also, the other, you know, point of view is um, when, we, um, when we talk about, um, uh, and I think utilities today is really, you know, um, uh, fearing, you know, they, they lack the customer centricity and, you know, uh, they could get, uh, they could easily be commoditized today. So if utilities really want to get ahead and be that, you know, financially optimized, I think they really need to get a head started on really bringing customers and really understanding, putting customers in the middle of uh, all of their value props, you know, is one thing that I can think of. That's very good point. The customer centric. I think uh, you know we we do see a lot of utility are changing and transforming and moving toward. But uh, we can do better. Uh, Ulrich, anything you want to add yes. here? I mean, uh, obviously, I agree with what Michael and Millie were saying concerning uh, cybersecurity and standards that we need. Um, I, I would like to highlight the difference that I see between different domains. Right, there are certain let me call it maybe base technologies. I think Michael was calling them uh, communication. This is something that you can more or less easily transfer from one domain to another. But there are also other challenges which are more difficult to transfer from one domain. And I want to give you an example. Um, in industry automation, factory, when you're automating a factory, usually all or most of the components come from the same vendor. You have usually closed systems and connecting it to the cloud is a completely different story then connecting an energy system where you have different components from different vendors. You have um, mentioned, was mentioned before, the privacy of the data. So you have different owners of the different assets. So there are completely different challenges compared, for example, to industry automation. Um, and I believe also in, in healthcare systems, um, at least within what's hospital or a group of hospitals owned by one company, everything is owned by one company. So there are only I would call them maybe base technologies or these, these underlying um, IT technologies. They are more or less common across different domains. Other solutions really have to be developed um, domain specific. Great. Uh, that's a great question to get this uh, kicked off. Uh, thank you, Ulrich. Uh, actually, building on that, um, I want to go back to a, a framework that um, Michael introduced, and that was the uh, Mike, your discussion about the, the layers of a digital platform, the electrical communications so data collection layer, and the organizational software layer. And uh, I, I thought that was really helpful. And I was just curious, really a question, maybe starting with Michael, but for all of you is, where do you see the biggest challenge lies in the framework of those layers? Is it in that organizational software layer? When we talk about this uh, uh, notion of uh, data coordination, particularly to the point that Ulrich just made about dealing with an environment here in the context of the utility work, uh, trying to integrate resources on the customer side where you've got a very uh, heterogeneous environment of devices from multiple countless manufacturers, not just on the grid side, but on the 
consumer side in homes and buildings and, and vehicles. So, um, again, maybe question to Michael first. In the context of those layers, where do you think the biggest challenge is and, 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 and what, what can be done about that? And then same question for the rest of the panelists. Let's say, uh, so there's challenges all over the place, Omar. Let's, uh, <laughs> all right, let's, let's start there. Okay. Um, and, and you know what? I don't, it, it depends on where you are in, in the cycle and the deployment of solutions inside of your facility. And let me just, rather, rather than say where the most is, I'll actually answer that, but I'll answer it last. Um, let's just talk about the complexity that you have across those three layers. Okay, the first, if you just start with kind of the electrical layer, um, there's a lot, when, when you think about assets that a utility buys, and it could be a pad mount transformer, a pole, um, you know, mount transformer, it could be reclosers, et cetera. These, these assets are capital expenditures that are expected to live for 20, 30, 40, even longer lifespan. So you think about the age and lifespan of electronics, okay? It's not meant to be that long. So you got two challenges. You have a lot of infrastructure that's in place that isn't equipped to be digital natively, so you can't necessarily get information. You can't detect if there's a crack in a transformer and, you know, the insulation material isn't, uh, isn't, isn't holding up. I mean, a lot of that's physical inspection today. So the first real challenge is just digitization of the assets themselves. And I think the second thing is we have to realize that even if you digitalize the assets, the business model is going to have to expand so that there's a constant refreshing of the electronics that goes in there. Because when you think about cybersecurity, the electronics that you put in today as computing power advances aren't going to be able to withstand a lot of the cyber attacks of 10 years from now or 15 years from now, I mean, let alone 50 years you know, from now. So that's kind of one, one problem that, that we have. The second, if we start thinking now about all of the assets that are out in the field. The next big challenge is, is collecting them all. So you have a very heterogeneous environment. You have products that come from a lot of vendors, and there's really a lack of standards in terms of what the data sets look like, how do they communicate and stuff. And I think at least having open standards is a good starting point. So every manufacturer publishes what these data streams are, allow people to go and integrate and bring that information in. And then as an industry work towards what is this commonality among communications as well as data standards. So to give a customer a sense of ease that, you know what, when they buy these assets, they're gonna be able to go and hook it up and collect information from, from anyone that's, that's out there. And then the last piece is really at the, at the solution level. Do you know that there's SCADA systems and stuff today that really once the data is in there, it's proprietary. You can't get it out unless you're really paying a lot of high price fees and stuff like that, even if you can get it out and then it may be a data extract. But when you start getting to the solution layer and stuff, just being able to open that up, being able to transmit and make the protocols available so that people can come and, and get the information out and exchange it openly. So it, there's, there's challenges across all three, but Omar, to come back, I think that that middle layer is really gonna become increasingly important as assets become more digital in nature that sit on the grid. And then certainly the, the systems that collect information today, we're gonna to have to have interfaces out there allowing for the seamless exchange of information. Thank you. Uh, Millie, how, how about you? Uh, sure. No, thanks, Michael. And uh, building on to m what Michael's meant, you know, talked about on really that middle layer, the data layer, you know, looking at the, again, the utility infrastructure, it's not sort of an easy, you know, rip, rip and replace, right? I think that's when we see data standardization really help govern and establish um, a bridge for different kind of systems to be able to talk to each other, right? From the older systems to legacy systems and the hardware to be able to talk to newer modern technology. And when you, you know, being a Californian, you know, wildfire prevention, vegetation management is very true to my heart, right? So when you look at 
the data. Uh, when you look at the sort of a multifaceted problem like vegetation management, you look at the data sources, you're looking at geospatial data, you're looking at um, uh, temporal spatial data, you're looking at the fire outage, you're looking at the historical fire records, you know, when you look at all these different sources of data that you're you know, putting into your system to be then, you know, run your advanced analytics and algorithm. I think, you know, the point I'm trying to get to is, yes, you know, we have collected data, but how do you automate that data ingestion pipeline? Today, SMEs uh, spend about 80% of their time doing sort of a processing, massaging, during the, doing a lot of data, cu data curation. So how do you you know, shorten this this span of unproductive type by building an automated ingestion pipeline, which is very very much metadata driven, policy based, so that you know you can um, automatically uh, do uh, data labeling, you know, data uh, annotation, you know, tag your data, and then apply you know apply your semantic knowledge on top so that it becomes meaningful to SMEs who can then use that sort of a data set for advanced analytics. And I think when you talk about uh, applying semantic knowledge, which is basically a cognitive ability, that is your construct of a digital twin of an asset. And that's how we get into that ultimate intelligent grid, a digital you know, twin of, of a grid. So I think, I think that's worth you kind know, of thinking about it from that perspective. I mean, data standardization is very very, very important and, you know, I think I'm familiar with DNP3 and a lot of transition works that's been happening from DNP3 to IEC 61850 and then, you know, in California rule that governs uh, California Rule 21 on IEEE 2030.5. You know, I think those are all good, but I, when you talk about the real world challenges, such as vegetation management, you know, how do you bring in the data, massage the data so you are able to provide the real time insights for somebody in the control room operations to be make to be able to make that key decision. Great. Handing it Thank off you. to Ulrich. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thanks, Millie. So my 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 comment actually would go exactly in the same direction as Millie. Yeah? Um, when you talk about digitalization, you always talk about scalable applications that apply to many many plants, right? So if you compare this say to mobile phones or, or tablets, these devices are more or less uh, similar. There's a large number of similar plants. If you think about uh, microgrids, if you think about P just PV plants, if you think about um, maybe hybrid plants where you have battery storage plus PV, maybe with an EV charging, they are all different, right? It's much more, I would say, the, the plurality of, of um, combination of components than even having them from different manufacturers. It's just making the problem significantly harder to come up with applications that are really scalable. Huh? And then getting back to what Millie said, I mean, creating a digital twin for this to reduce engineering efforts, I think this is one of the biggest challenges. Great. Perfect. Uh, you know, I, I want to pick up one question from the Q&A, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's kind of follow-on question on this one. So, uh, Michael, you talk about uh, on this slide, on specific slide that uh, Omar touched on, you mentioned, uh, open and the scalable data platform. You know, we, we, we as a research organization, both EPRI and uh, Stanford, we really love it. And uh, the question is, uh, uh, what is the business model for uh, for a corporate company and uh, look into this open uh, data platform? So it's a it's a good question, and I think. I think that um, you know we, we have to learn a. Um, I think that we have to learn a lesson from the IT side of the equation when we start thinking about industrial systems and stuff. And the, the world doesn't want proprietary systems. What the world's looking for is to have a open systems, and that really manifested itself. You know, as we think about the solutions that have come about in the IT space. Everyone wants to feel that they have a sense of choice and that they have a sense of being able to go and. Um, being able to go and choose best of breed solutions to kind of come together. And I think really that's where the industrial um, the industrial markets are heading. They're just more being less mature in, in their thinking. So if you think about it, those business models have translated, has translated into the IT space. You can have a best of breed solution that comes out and still become um, 
you know, relevant in the market. And then also, just because things are open, you still can you still can have access to data and charge for access to data if it's providing relevant value. I mean, ultimately, the customer determines if there's value that's being generated from this information and stuff. But the more that we can create these open standards and reduce a lot of the complex engineering that only slows down the pace of innovation and allows for the exchange of insight, the faster we're going to be able to grow. And, you know, we look at that and saying that, you know, growth is what's going to ultimately uh, drive us. And if, you know, things that you want to charge for, you still can go and do that. And the market will ultimately, you know, tell us whether it's going to be successful or not. But there's plenty of examples out there. Um, you know, in, in the IT world and in other uh, industries that say that this is a, uh, a viable path. Terrific. Uh, Billy, uh, Ulrich, I'm not sure if you two want to add any add uh, add add comments here. No, I think Michael uh, <laughs> might have pretty much covered everything that was in my mind, you know, and, you know, giving my two cents from IT perspective, definitely, as you see all the innovation, you know, around open source software, you know, having a, a community contribute, uh, you know, over proprietary, and there is definitely a, you know, a huge, huge advantage in terms of how rapidly you can accelerate and, you know, move forward to actually being, you know, you have a larger um, base to be able to use it and provide feedback. Mm -hmm. Ulrich, uh, you are muted. Yeah, thanks. Um, so that's that's what I just wanted to to add. So the Fever platform I was presenting is actually looking in that direction. Um, you could easily imagine opening up this platform to let developers around the world develop these applications, and then the plant owners can actually buy these applications. You could have a rating system. Um, obviously, at this point, there is no final decision from the company whether or not we do this, um, but it at least goes in the same line to have an open access platform. And as Michael said, the funding model behind this would be then using the, the applications, the, the data scientists that develop the application would get some funding from this and, and uh, Siemens is a platform operator as well. Terrific. Okay, great. Oh. Um, there was a yeah, there was a question that came in, and this is, uh, I think, directed to uh, to Ulrich. Um, uh, you had mentioned uh, more storage uh, being needed. Uh, what are the most promising storage solutions? Uh, do you see um, any need for new energy carriers to complement the electric grid? Oh, I think, um, and this is referring to uh, hydrogen uh, as an example mm -hmm. of an energy carrier as more renewables come online. So maybe Ulrich, you, and if uh, Millie or Michael would like to comment on that as well. Please, please weigh in. Yeah, I, I can take this as a give a first response. So from from my perspective, um, battery storage as we know it today um, applies to certain applications, cars, maybe for um, residential homes to some extent. But you, if you think more than say five or ten years ahead, you need really long term storage. You need maybe even something like seasonal storage. And for this. I think battery uh, is not the right the chemical battery as we know it today. There is not really a, a revolution in technology. is not not the right solution. Um, hydrogen right now is a very promising candidate, and probably you all are aware there is a huge program run in in Europe in order to boost hydrogen. Also in the U.S., there's a huge program to run this. Just I think a few weeks ago they announced a new national lab program with um, 60, 70, or even more million U.S. dollars in this direction. So. For um, increasing renewables beyond the degrees, what we see today in certain um, countries and, and states, uh, we definitely need an alternative to battery storage. Thank you. Would Michael or Millie like to comment on that question as well? Um, candidly speaking, I'm not as familiar. Uh, I haven't worked very close to the batteries, so I'm looking forward to Michael and, and Ruch and you know, learning. That's going to be my takeaway, key takeaway from our session today. I think um, you know a lot of it's depending on the applications and stuff. I mean, we're seeing seeing a lot of advances when we think about. Um, just lithium-ion batteries when they start becoming for uh, you know EVs and ranges are increasing and stuff, they are starting to become more cost-effective for grid-scale grid -scale solutions. 
But again, they're going to run out and not have the power density needed for other applications when you start thinking about, you know, long haul trucks, um, you know, as, as an example. So it, it really depends on the application. I think that the, the battery world and energy storage in general is probably going to be one of the fastest growing areas of development that's going to occur over the next, you know, couple of decades. And, you know, one of the big things that I think we have to pay attention to when we think about it is the controls. And are we optimizing the controls for the right type of energy storage, whether it's charging, discharging cycles, effectively managing it to get the optimum efficiency out of it? That's going to be a key role that we're going to have to play and that we're investing in is to make sure that as these technologies come out, we're staying agnostic to it and able to deploy heterogeneous type of battery technologies across our Dura solutions. Thank you. Okay. Terrific. We have about uh, uh, four minutes left. I'd like to have a, a last question to all the panelists. And uh, we typically ask this question in the end, is the uh, role of uh, the COP research in this ecosystem? We asked this question last week to the government uh, agencies. We'd like, to, we'd like to ask this question to you guys because there's different types of organizations from the research. I, I saw uh, Oryx for number, which is $500 million in, in the clean energy sector. Wow, that's more than office electricity funding from the Department of Energy. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so, so we have a university research, government funded research, and the industry uh, funded research like APRI. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, I'd like to have a one minute and less each of you to share your perspective of the role of COP research in this ecosystem. Yeah, maybe I can go ahead. So the 500 million was not only for renewables, that was for all 14 topics. Yeah. Um, I work for a research center. For me, this is uh, the place where innovation is brought from, let's say, academic and, and research center research into real business. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we work closely with the business units where we directly work with end customers and see the problems they face. And on the other hand, we work closely with national labs, universities to see the most advanced technologies that is going far beyond what we do in our research center. And just bridging this gap for me is really the key task for a research center like Siemens Core Technology. Yeah. And just to kind of add to that, you know, for Hitachi, I think I mentioned earlier, Hitachi invests about 4% of their total revenue to R&D. Uh, you know, worldwide. And when you, uh, touching on Michael's, uh, you know, original slide really around the safety and resiliency and sustainability, you know, if you want to tie in all that, we at Hitachi understand that we just by Hitachi itself cannot solve all the problems. So we understand the value of, you know, research organizations like EPRI working with the government and just organization to help us guide in terms of, you know, data standardization and so forth. And I think, you know, and for us, you know, what, what I do on a day-to-day -day is, you know, tapping into the research area and see how we can, you um, uh, how, how we can, you know, test the market penetration and really test the commercial viability of some of this IP. You know, can we actually uh, scale this IP? Can we actually, um, you know, make it at scale for some of our customers? Does it really make sense? So I think that gives us that safe heaven for us to be able to venture out in a very limited uh, and structured setting. And I think that is, um, you know, it, it's really what Rich mentioned, uh, this R&D is really the forward-looking vehicle to be able to continue uh, more innovation and more technology. And, you know, I'm so lucky that every organization I've been working uh, in the past 10 years work very, very closely with the R&D team to help kind of, you know, guide the, uh, the innovation. Hey. And, um, you know, what corporate, corporate technology and corporate research plays an extremely vital, vital role at Eaton, I think, in all, all corporations uh, and stuff. And it's really the strategic link between what the businesses and the markets are seeing versus the new technology introductions and what are going to be the revolutionary changes in the technology advances that occur in the future. And really, they look at how do you create the right level of partnerships 
public and private type of partnerships to help advance that research and look at the early stage technology, the TRL levels, advance it to a point where we can now start solving real customer problems that our business units face and really accelerate that pace of innovation so that we are staying current, we are staying uh, contemporary and creating that open innovation system with the world to help advance our customers' uh, journey forward. Great. Terrific. Oma? Well, uh, we are perfect timing. Uh, you're, you're an incredible panel. We are right at our conclusion. So I want to thank all of you. Um, Michael, Millie, Ulrich, fantastic discussion. I wish we had more time. Uh, thank you uh, for, for all of you. And thank you to all of you attending uh, remotely. Again, we will be posting the uh, web, webcast uh, recording and presentations on the EPRI and Stanford sites. Uh, and if there's any questions, you can reach out to uh, Liang or myself on that. So with that, I want to thank you all uh, for uh, a, a wonderful panel. So again, Michael, Millie, and Ulrich, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day or evening. Take care. You too. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.